If this goes on, don't panic. Bringing hope to the world through speculative fiction. Hello, all. This is Alan, and this is my book review column, Bailey's Books. This will be my last book review column for 2024. This episode leans heavy into the Flame Tree Press books that I need to catch up on, but I've got I've got two science fiction novellas, a fantasy novella from Rosarium Publishing. They do some great stuff, by the way. Check them out. A horror novel, a collection of stories that vacillate between fantasy and horror, dark fantasy. I guess, and a book of interviews with folks in speculative fiction. There's lots of great stuff in here. If you like anything, make sure you check out the episode notes for names and links if your podcatcher allows for that. All right, we are going to start off with some science fiction. LaGrange Point by Alan Stroud, published by Flame Tree Press, 2023. This is the third novella in the six novella series that makes up the middle of Alan Stroud's Fractal series. As before, I'll keep this short as the book itself is less than 100 pages. So far, this has been my favorite of them. This one combines the action of series with the philosophy of Europa and kind of comes out halfway between the two. And don't forget Europa had a good deal of action too. But the philosophy from that one has really just stuck with me a lot longer. Anyway, like the previous books, each chapter alternates between characters. The characters in this book include a lower-level employee at the LaGrange space station named Jason and an AI. The station acts as a midway point between the moon and Mars. It's used as a kind of customs office slash truck stop for folks transporting stuff between the two planets. The book opens with Jason finding some illegal materials while inspecting a shipment coming through LaGrange Point. Unfortunately for Jason, larger powers are at play, and he gets sucked into the middle of things. Meanwhile, the AI has been created mad scientist style and has decided that it wants off its leash. Then it's dragged into the shenanigans, literally against its will. I really enjoyed Stroud's representation of the AI. He did a great job rounding out its personality with an interesting backstory instead of the usual two-dimensional evil AI we so often see. This novella also starts to tie together pieces of the first two novels and the first two novellas. It was satisfying to see those pieces come together while not ending in such a tidy way as the feel artificial. As in previous stories within this series, Lagrange Point continues to explore themes of disability and technology in interesting and thought-provoking ways. He also continues exploring corporate ethics, or the lack thereof. In all honesty, this series deals a lot with corporate ethics, so if you've read beyond the first novel, this isn't a surprise. All in all, I felt this was a very solid addition to the series. Pick this one up if you like reading about real AI as opposed to 2024 corporate AI. I hope you can hear those scare quotes. Explorations of Disabilities, and Corporate Machinations. All right, I'm going to continue on by talking about Terra by Alan Stroud, also published by Flame Tree Press in 2023. This is the fourth installment of Stroud's novella series taking place in his fractal universe. So far, this has been my favorite of these by far, which sounds weird because I kind of just said that in the last one, but... Upon writing the review of LaGrange Point, that was true, and upon writing the review of Terra, it is also true. <laughs> so I guess, I think, I feel like he's really hitting his stride here uh, with the third and the fourth novellas, so I am really looking forward to seeing if five and six continue in this manner. So um, that's no shade on the other novellas. This one just fed me what I was really hungry for, and the timing was right. 
As the stories have spiraled closer and closer to the action of the main plot, this is the first one to hit directly on events of one of the novels. At the beginning of the second novel, a large solar farm is destroyed, threatening system-wide energy issues. This novella is the story of an investigator following the trail of the terrorist responsible and falling into worldwide intrigue. This story is part detective noir, part spy thriller, slowly tying varying elements together to create a coherent story from all the different parts. Philosophically, this story deals with ideas of free will, the choices we make, and why we make them. It also gives you a better idea of what Earth has become, as most of the previous stories really take place off-world. And Strauss' vision of the future is interesting. Like any cyberpunk you've read, corporations are equal in power to most of the governments. However, where cyberpunk is all cynicism and dystopia, Stroud's vision does seem to include positive agreements between corporate and government entities. I'd really like to see these relationships explored more in his future contributions to this universe. Oh, by the way, that body jumping assassin is back too, and we really start to get some answers around this particular character. So you can kind of see that the novella series is spiraling closer and closer to the main story, which also makes me very curious how five and six will continue. If they will continue to spiral closer or if Stroud will change the pattern. Check this one out for elaborate world building, hard boiled futuristic detectives, and system wide conspiracies. Next up is Hellweg's Keep by Justin Hawley, published by Flame Tree Press 2023. When I first received this book from Flame Tree Press, I immediately loved the cover and the description. I think it's best described using some of the cover summary here, so I'm just going to use a little bit of that. 37 miners have vanished in an off-world titanium mine called Hellweg's Keep. FBI agent Kendra Oman has been assigned to find them. As evidence of occult practices at the mine emerges, Kendra realizes the answers she seeks will only be found underground in the claustrophobic labyrinth of shafts and natural caves within Hellweg's Keep. So that got me really excited. Also, the cover is a science fiction-y circle with a glowing red eye in the middle above a planet. So I thought that was really cool too. I think this book is best described as a mix of Dead Space, The X-Files, and one of those paranormal investigation shows. Admittedly, even though the story was attractive to me, it took a while for me to get to it with my interview reading, other book reviews, and the occasional book I do not feel obligated to read. Meanwhile, I lent it to my mother, and she loved it, so I made it a priority to get back to it as soon as I could. While I can't say I was as enthusiastic about it as my mom, I did enjoy the book. There are some majorly badass women in this book that drive the plot along, and some really cool monsters. In fact, the monsters were probably my favorite part. The science fictional aspects were a little thin, so if this book sounds interesting to you, don't look at that part too hard. If you enjoy those horror movies that are more about the atmosphere and the action than those types of details, I wouldn't hesitate to pick it up. I give Holly bonus points for having neurodivergent characters as well. Pick this one up if you like horror in space, warrior women, and really cool monsters. Okay, now we're going to take a little break from the Flame Tree books. The next one is called The Day and Night Books of Mardu Fox by Nisi Shaw, published by Rosarium Publishing, October 2024. When Rosarium sent this book over to me, I was immediately excited to cover it. I've been meaning to read something by Nisi Shaw for ages, and this book connects with the fandom of mine for my 20s, Jack Kerouac. Yes, I know, very cliche, and yet, I still believe Kerouac was one hell of a writer, if less than a great person. As one of my undergrad professors said, my God, the man was an asshole. Anyway, I was immediately hooked. This might be the quickest turnaround I've ever had on a review book. In case you're not intimately familiar with Kerouac's work, Mardot Fox is a central character in one of his more famous books, The Subterraneans. 
And as a side note, Kerouac was notorious for basing his characters on real people, to the point where many people were famously angry with him. Thus, Mardot is really based on Aileen Lee. The story connects with a subterranean story through her perspective, but it's much more than just a retelling. Day and Night starts when Mardot is 10 and runs through her life up through her 30s. It follows her relationships with Kerouac, her mother, Mardot's on and off lover, as well as her husband, and most importantly, her sisters, one of which publishes a quote unquote Bull Dyke magazine and another that has been committed to a psychiatric institution. Day and Night is told through a series of journal entries reporting important parts of her life, then skipping 10 or so years and reporting on that part of her life. And it re just repeats that pattern multiple times. However, don't be disappointed. This is speculative fiction and there is a twist. And I'm not giving anything away here, but Mardot and some other folks in the story have the ability to physically slip into a parallel dream world. This, of course, is completely unconnected with Kerouac's work. The story is solidly written. It's not overly poetic, though it contains poetry. It's not overly fantastical, though it contains elements of fantasy. It does manage to convey an element of the romance that Kerouac brought to his work as well. I really enjoyed this one, and I would recommend it to readers who enjoy historical fiction, the beats, and magical realism. Okay, back to Flame Tree Press. Next one is One Eye Opened in That Other Place by Christy Noble, published by Flame Tree Press 2024. Not too long ago, I covered Noble's previous collection, Promise. I've since discovered that she considers Promise, and now One Eye Opened, as a kind of trilogy of collections. The first collection in the series, The Best of Our Past and the Worst of Our Future, won a Bram Stoker Award. In case you don't know, that is the highest honor devoted solely to horror. And honestly, I'm looking to go back and read that one when I get a chance. Ha, if I ever get a chance. While The Best of Our Past focused on supernatural and psychological horror, and Promise was more oriented towards science fiction in science fictional horror, this final collection focuses on weird and fantastical stories, and that is the capital W Weird. Despite the differences in their foundational genre, I can see the relationship between One-Eyed Open and Promise immediately. Nogal's characteristic fascination with identity and isolation permeates every story, as does her obsession with uncanny characters and situations. Plots will often end in unusual places, highlighting the strange unreality her characters grapple with. Two of my favorite stories happen early in the collection. The first is called Playmate, and it is fairly lighthearted for Nogal. The main character goes back to her childhood home to find it displaced. She also has an unusual encounter with a childhood friend. There's not much more I can say than that without giving it away. I will say it definitely took a turn I didn't expect. The second story I'll highlight is called Waterfall. In this story, a pair of highly popular and highly unlikely to be popular high school students take a liking to a new girl. Eventually, they invite her to join them in their success. And in a very monkey paw way, things do not go according to plan. I also enjoyed the jabs at popular culture in this story. Pick this one up if you like the creepy, the disturbing, and the unexplained. And now our final book of this particular column, Women of Horror and Speculative Fiction in Their Own Words, Conversations with Authors and Editors, edited by Sebastian Dubinsky and Christina Kona, published 2024 by Bloomsbury Academic. This book was sent to me by Seb Dubinsky. Essentially, this book is a transcript of interviews with 24 or 25 folks who identify as women. I found the book to be quite interesting, if a bit academic. The interviews generally start with the same question and then proceed to get more in-depth around the ideas of genre and gender in the publishing community and within each author's work. There are a ton of interesting women interviewed in this book, and many that have been on our podcast, including folks like Malka Older, Eugene Bacon, Nuzo Ono, Ellen Datlow, and our very own Kat Rambo. If you listen to all of our interview episodes, you probably heard me talking with Kat about her answers some time back. Overall, I found the book to be very interesting. 
but not one I could read straight through. So it took me a while to get all the way through it. Some of the questions were repetitive, and so were some of the answers. Additionally, it didn't seem like there was a lot of interaction between the interviewers and the interviewees, as some of the interviewees' answers clearly indicated they didn't understand the question. However, I'd say this isn't the type of book you would read straight through unless you're an academic researching this very thing. Nonetheless, I thought the interviews were really interesting and insightful regarding how the writers and editors have navigated publishing throughout their lives. So if you like interviews, if you like nonfiction about fiction writers, and if you are into academics, I would say pick this one up. All right, and that's it this time. If you've enjoyed this column or anything on our podcast, please share us with your friends on social media. And you can always go out there and give us a like or give us a review. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Mm-hmm.